Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Scleroderma Foundation Virtual University Patient Education Fall Series. Today's event is titled Taking the Mystery Out of Hospice and Palliative Care. My name is Angel Soto. I'm the Programs and Services Associate for the Scleroderma Foundation and National Office, and I'm accompanied today by David Murad, Director of Chapter Relations, and our guest speaker, Mary Crow. Before we get started, I wanted to share some quick notes on today's event. If you're properly logged into the webinar, you should be seeing the PowerPoint presentation on your screen and hearing my voice. If you have dialed into the event via phone, please turn your computer microphone down to avoid any sound feedback. If you're using a handheld device, on the other hand, you may be required to swipe left or right on the screen to view the full presentation. And don't worry because today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for future broadcasts. We encourage attendees to use the question and chat feature on the right side of the screen because we will be holding a Q&A section at the end of the presentation. So let's get started. I'm happy to introduce today's guest speaker, Mary Crow. Mary Crow is the Director and of Professional and Community Education at Care Dimensions. Mary holds a master's degree of social work from Boston College Graduate School of Social Work and postgraduate certificates in gerontology and alcohol counseling. She also has a facilitator certification virtual dementia tour, dementia live certified facilitator, cares dementia specialist, as well as being an end of life nursing education consortium core trainer. Over the last 14 years, Mary has led the organization's professional and community educational outreach program coordinating and delivering hundreds of programs each year for healthcare professionals, families, and community groups. Mary has worked as a medical social worker for over 25 years in acute care, rehabilitation, skilled nursing, and adult day health settings, caring for individuals and families with advanced illness or who are at end of life. Um, she does all this and is also an adjunct professor at North Shore Community College and a visiting professor at Salem State University. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, Mary Crow. Uh, thank you so much, Angel and David. I really appreciate it. It's such an honor to be on here today with you and, and to provide this program. Uh, this is certainly a topic that I feel extremely passionate about and I just love to talk to people about. And, you know, I, I, I always say that the, uh, the the things we need to talk about most are the ones we run from furthest. And thirst is certainly a topic that is so essential. Um, and, and sometimes people have such a misunderstanding of what hospice is. Uh, and so they tend to not want to hear about it. So I'm going to go through today a lot of myths and misconceptions for you around hospice. I want to give you a real clear understanding about hospice care. I'm going to also talk to you about palliative care, uh, which is, a, a, you know, it's a separate concept. And I want to talk to you about both. There's certainly a relationship between these two, but there are some distinctions as well. So I'm going to be able to go through both for you today. So um, I'm going to, and, and then I'm going to be looking forward to, uh, to the end of the program where we, we have some question and answer time as well. So, uh, you know, it's, I, I have, as, as um, Angela had mentioned, I, I've been doing this for a long time. I've actually been uh, in the in a medical social worker by profession for over 35 years. And uh, really all of my work has been around advanced illness and also um, end of life work. So, like I said, this is something that uh, that I really uh, I, I come to really like people to know more about. So we'll talk about hospice first. Um, and, you know, hospice care, a lot of times, again, people have this misconception of hospice care. Uh, it's people think of hospice as a place. Uh, people also think that uh, that hospice care is really for people in their last hours or days of life, and neither of those are true, actually. Hospice is, and, and some people actually think that hospice is a new phenomenon because they hear more about it right now. Hospice really is a philosophy of care, and it recognizes that you know, every single person is is an individual that they're that that they live and they want to live out their life with respect and dignity. They want to be pain free. So hospice really focuses in on um, care, compassion. It focuses in on dignity and and to help people live fully for whatever time they have left. 
like I said, there's a misconception about the word hospice. Sometimes people, when they hear that word, they think death or dying. The word hospice actually means hospitality. Uh, so it's to host or to tend to. So it's actually a very positive word. And really what hospice care, like I said, is all about, it's about helping people to live fully for whatever time they have left. And what you're going to hear from me today, too, is that it's not about last hours or days to live. And certainly we take care of people at that stage. That's for sure. Uh, but really people can be on hospice care for a long period of time as well. So I'm going to go over that with you, too. So, you know, hospice care actually came to the United States in the mid-70s. Um, so this is something, though, that's been around since medieval times. But it came to the United States in the 70s. And, and although it can certainly be an inpatient type of place, it's really that philosophy of care, as I mentioned. And it's to help care for people with a terminal illness uh, where the, the plan is really around care and comfort. So the thing I love about hospice care, too, is it's about the whole person. You know, in hospice care, uh, you're not a patient. You're really, they, they treat people like a human being. And it's really, it's, they, it's a non-medicalized look at that, right? So we medicalize healthcare so much in this country. And certainly we provide medical care. Uh, but at the same time, again, um, we, we look at all aspects of the individual. So it addresses not just the physical needs, but the emotional and the spiritual needs as well. The other thing about it is if we're taking care of people's spirit, mind, and body, we need to do this as a team. So there is a interdisciplinary team uh, that actually tends to individuals and to families. So who is on that team? Uh, you have the nurses, a medical director of hospice, the primary care physician, and I'm going to go into that too around primary care physician when we talk about myths and misconceptions social workers, chaplains, volunteers, you know, hospice organizations were founded by grassroots groups of volunteers, uh, and volunteers are an integral part uh, of hospice care. We have to, uh, in hospice, we follow what's called Medicare conditions of participation, and one of the Medicare conditions of participation is that you you have to have volunteers on uh, for, for patients that are, for so many volunteers per patient that you have on service. Um, we have hundreds, of, we have about 600 volunteers, uh, and, which is a wonderful thing, that do a variety of different things uh, from doing visits with individuals and families to sitting vigil to actually doing dementia support, other things. Uh, they can do a variety of tasks, and they're such an integral part. We have hospice aides. Uh, who provide that personal care. Uh, bereavement counselors also, and what bereavement counselors do is they actually uh, provide support to those people that are left behind, who, who are, are living with the loss of that individual afterwards. And I'll talk more about that bereavement support in a bit. In addition to that, um, people aren't aware that you can receive physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, et cetera, and be on hospice. Now, again, there's a distinction. If somebody is receiving these types of therapies and they're receiving um, this type of rehab in terms of, um, you know, getting really being rehabilitated in a way, it's not really intended in that way if it's active rehab for that purpose. But what these types of services are used for in hospice care is Hospice wants people to be able to do as much as possible for as long as possible. So we want to maximize quality of life and, and abilities for people. So if a person is in need of positioning or, uh, or if they're having some difficulties around, you know, even some uh, pain or comfort issues, they need help in terms of like a customized wheelchair or even issues around feeding where they might need like some built up utensils or issues around swallowing. This is where you call PTOT speech in and they will do a consultation. They don't stay involved and follow as if somebody is on an active rehab program, but what they do is they come in and they can help in terms of, again, maximizing people's comfort and abilities in that way. Also, complementary therapies. Um, complementary therapies are wonderful. They are just what they are called, a complement to traditional medicine. Now, we do have a robust complementary therapies department, and it consists of music therapy, massage, art, aromatherapy, pet therapy, Reiki. Not all hospices have this. 
uh, even though there's been scientific evidence showing that these types of therapies actually promote well-being, um, not all hospices use that. Now, why they don't do that is because these services are not reimbursable under hospice care, under the Medicare benefit. Now, we don't think that that's a reason why not to provide that. We, we know that this has a positive effect on people. So we actually, like I said, have a, a very robust complementary therapies department. Um, again, you can see it, it varies. So that's a question to always ask a hospice provider is do they have these types of things because not all do. Um, this was actually our first pet therapy dog years ago. His name is Patrick and has done amazing work in this field of reaching people uh, with advanced illness and end of life. And Patrick has now retired uh, and is uh, and he's, he's just an amazing animal. It's amazing how intuitive they are in terms of this type of work. So some of the essential components of hospice is it's about alleviating suffering. Uh, and it's, again, around not just the physical, around the emotional, spiritual, and social uh, you know, in my career of, of over 35 years, some of the most uh, the, the most excruciating type of suffering that I have seen wasn't the physical at all. It might have been around the emotional or spiritual. So it's important that we tend to all those components. Certainly, again, hospice is around improving quality of life and helping people to transition in their journey through their illness. Uh, and also, again, it's about hope. I'm going to hold off on that for a minute because I'm going to talk about hope when we go into the myths and misconceptions now. So one of those myths and misconceptions that all hospices are alike are somehow related. I actually had somebody say to me, geez, I asked for hospice, where were you? And what I like to tell them is that, again, you didn't specify. There are, when, when we're the largest hospice in the state of Massachusetts, uh, and we are the second oldest by a month, we're over 40 years old, We've been, uh, we started in 1978, we're a freestanding hospice, and again, the largest, uh, and we're not for profit also. Now, when we started, there were only about three hospices around in the state. Now, there, if you look in the state of Massachusetts alone, and I know there are people from other states here, um, that basically there are there's over 80 different types of hospices here. So there are they're all different. And, and we certainly, as hospices, we follow those Medicare conditions of participation, which I talked about. Um, those, are one, those are some of the requirements, but there are other distinctions. So you want to ask those questions when you're interviewing about a hospice, about what, what else do they offer that are, that's unique to them. Um, there are for-profit hospices. There are not-for-profit hospices. Um, some of the distinctions I can give you is um, like disease specific programs. Uh, you, you know, we do things like that in terms of respiratory and cardiac and, and, and dementia programs, uh, specific programs around veterans, even the LGBTQ community. So there's specific. So find out about those things. Uh, we have two inpatient facilities, licensed inpatient facilities. Those are distinctions. Does so when you're when you're interviewing a hospice, is that something that they offer? How about those complementary therapies? How many physicians do they have on service? Those are the types of things that would be helpful for you to ask a hospice provider. Another myth and misconception of hospice is a place is that it can be a place. There are certainly inpatient hospice facilities, but like I mentioned, hospice is actually that philosophy of care. Um, so, it, you know, hospice can really be provided anywhere the person calls home. So whether that be in the person's private residence or apartment, or whether it be in a skilled nursing facility, assisted living, it could be in a group home, a hospital setting, it can be in um, even a homeless shelter or prison, anywhere the person calls home, and it can certainly fluctuate. And like I said, there are those inpatient hospice facilities. There are different types. There's licensed inpatient facilities, and there's also residential facilities. They are very different in terms of the, uh, the, the care, in terms of the skilled care that they provide around the clock. Uh, the licensed inpatient facilities provide skilled care around the clock, where the residential facilities don't. There's also a difference between, um, in terms of how they are reimbursed as well. So um, the licensed inpatient facilities are covered under insurance. Uh, and so it's different in terms of those levels of care. But like I said, some people think that they have to go somewhere if they come on to hospice. No, hospice will come to you. 
see, another myth and misconception, just for cancer. Now, when I say hospice to people, this is the first thing that comes to mind, um, that, it, you know, it's really around people that have cancer. Uh, not true at all. Certainly, cancer is still the number one diagnosis, about 30 Six to seven percent of the people that we cared for last year had a cancer diagnosis, but actually the top three are cancer, uh, Alzheimer's and related dementias, and cardiac disease. With respiratory coming in fourth, but it's you know there's there's so many so many reasons why again a person it's not it's not disease specific. Basically, it's anything that makes a person terminal in nature. There are some general criteria for hospice. And basically what it is is that a person have a terminal disease and that it's expected that, it, that, that the physician wouldn't be surprised if they didn't live beyond a six-month period of time. Now, how it's actually written, because a lot of times people think you can't be on hospice if you, if you live beyond six months. Well, that's not true. Actually, people can be on hospice for years, believe it or not. What happens is if somebody meets criteria for hospice, and there are disease-specific criteria that come into play too, in addition to those general criteria that I mentioned to you, basically what happens is a person gets approved for 90 days. After that 90-day period, the doctors and the team come together and they, they look again as the person's still meeting criteria. If they, get, if they are meeting criteria, they get approved for a second 90 days. After the second 90-day period, the same thing happens. He, the, the team comes together. Uh, is the person still meeting criteria? If so, they get approved for 60 days. So there's two 90-day periods and then an unlimited number of 60-day periods. These are called recertification periods. Now, so w there's a close eye kept on. Is the person still hospice eligible and is they meeting? Now, people can graduate off of hospice. They can improve and get better. And if they do that, and then they decline again, it, there's no time in between uh, that they have to wait to come back on to service. Sometimes it's having the hospice services involved that's helping them to do so well too. But people can graduate off of hospice. And then the other thing is that people can choose to come off of hospice. Now, what I have found in my career though is that, you know, often, um, you know, people, you know, individuals and families think, you know, it's too soon, it's too soon, it's too soon. Um, you know, in the old adage of it's always too soon before it's too late. Um, but what happens is that people wait so long to come on, and then sometimes they wish they had come on sooner. So that's more often. I see less people coming off by choice as opposed to them saying we wish we had come on sooner. Another one, uh, again, I, I had just spoke to this about um, can only stay on for six months. No, they can stay on for as long as they're, they're indicated. So like I said, with those recertification periods, everybody's journey is different. Everybody's journey is unique. So, it, you know, people can, they can certainly decline at varying rates. So like I said, people can be on hospice for years and still be appropriate. So it, it really varies. And like I said, a very close eye is kept on that. Hospice is just for the patient. No, one of the things I love about it is for the whole system. So it's not just for the individual. It's for the individual and their support network, their family. And when I say family, I mean anybody who loves and supports you. So it, it's for that whole support network that they have. So it really caters. It's, you know, uh, end of life or advanced illness is not just about that person. It's about it really affects everybody uh, in, in, your, in your network. So it really supports everyone. Another myth and misconception, and this is a big one, right? Hospice involvement in a patient's care leads to hastening of death. Uh, it's not true at all. Actually, there are extensive studies on this, and what they found was that hospice involvement doesn't hasten death at all. It actually, people live longer on hospice, and there were two main reasons for this that they found. One was that when people's uh, individuals' uh, pain or other symptoms were well managed, that people had more quality and quantity of time. Uh, and the second thing was it was that extra TLC that supported that person. So what they found on an average, it was that people were living longer on hospice. And that's pretty consistent in some pretty extensive studies that have gone on. What I have seen sometimes is, you know, and I, I've, I've had people approach me and they said, so well, see, you know, uh, I, I finally called hospice in, and then my loved one died a day or two later. And what happens is that, like I said, they wait so long is that 
then by the time that a person does agree to have hospice in, it's when the person is really actively dying. And then they were going to die a day or two later. So it's not hospice involvement that leads to that. It's really that, it, you know, the time that they waited so long to when the person was really in that actively dying state. So that's what we, we often see. Another one is that hospice provides 24-hour care. Now, you know, a lot of times, and I've had people say, oh, good, you're here, yeah, here's your room. Well, we don't move in. It's not that kind of care. We provide intermittent care, but we do it 24-7. So you don't move in. You don't have round-the-clock care with hospice, but you do have visits from the team regularly throughout the week. So it's intermittent care, but they're available 24-7. So if we get a call at 2 or 3 in the morning, and whether it be because of a physical, emotional, or spiritual issue, uh, it's not an answering service that answers the phone with us. We actually have clinicians answer the phone, and then people can go out at any time, round the clock, seven days a week. So it's provided in that way, but it's not living care. Hospice care is expensive. This is another, um, I, you know, people, I have had people say to me, well, I can't do hospice because I can't afford it. Actually, hospice is a covered service. This is a benefit that people are entitled to. And, and a hospice is covered. It's covered under Medicare. It's covered under uh, private insurances, HMOs, PPOs. It's covered under Medicaid. Um, so it's and and again check with the hospice facility when you're doing that. Um, for we actually um, we for people we would never turn somebody away because of inability to pay. Uh, so we actually uh, do do some free care as well. Ask the hospice about that. Um, so but generally again that people aren't receiving a bill. They don't have that. What is covered under the hospice benefit? The team visits. Any medication pertaining to the terminal illness and any equipment needs that a person has and also that bereavement follow-up after the person dies, all of that is covered under the hospice benefit. Uh, another one is that uh, an individual must be homebound or bedridden. So a lot of times this is one of those big misconceptions that, uh, you know, hospice comes and then the person takes to the bed and waits for that medical event to happen. Not true at all. Again, this is one um, that, you know, we actually, like I said, hospice wants people to be as, you know, as active as possible for as long as they're able to, uh, to do the things that they enjoy doing. Now, how where this comes in is that in order for a person uh, uh, to be covered under the uh the Visiting Nurse Association, um, is that they have to be homebound status. So I think that's why people think if you're on hospice, you have to be homebound as well. Um, you know, the visiting nurse comes in for only a certain period of time, and you do have to be homebound. It's one of the regulations. So if they called and said, geez, we're coming out at 11, uh, you know, and the person said, geez, can you come at a different time? I'm going out to lunch with my family. Technically, they're not even supposed to be in there to see you because you're not homebound. Now, if we called and you said, geez, can you come at a different time because I'm going out to lunch with my family, we'd be thrilled because that's one of the whole premises of hospice is, again, we want people to be able to do the things that they enjoy so much for as long as possible. So you don't have to be homebound nor bedridden. Another one is that people feel that, geez, uh, and even the primary care physicians sometimes think this, that if I, if my patient comes on to hospice or if my loved one goes on to hospice or if I go on to hospice, then i got to give up my primary care physician. And I've had them for like 25 or 30 years, right? So I think people worry about this. The primary care physician does not come out of the picture. They're very much involved. They're very much a part of the team. So there is good communication uh, between the hospice team and also the primary care physician. So very much a part of that still. Hospice care is about giving up hope. You know, and I, I, I've heard this, that people think this, that, geez, if we call in hospice, that means that we're just saying, ah, that's it, you know, and again, here we are waiting for that medical event. It's not about giving up hope. It's about redefining hope. And there's a lot to hope for when people have an advanced illness, uh, you know, and, and, and sometimes it's not a cure that is possible. But again, it might be 
time to be free of pain and other symptoms, to have more time with loved ones, uh, to even to have time to finish unfinished business, to reconcile, make them. There's a lot to do at this stage of life. So there's a lot to hope for still yet. Uh, and again, so a, a lot of times, you know, we help people in that regard. Uh, people feel that if you're, they're not a do, if they're a full code and not a do not resuscitate, that they can't be on hospice. That's not true. Also, you can be a full code and come on hospice. Um, you know, I always say that it's interesting. I feel like as healthcare workers, we need to do a better job at explaining things to people, because you think, okay, well, if somebody is pursuing comfort measures, right, care and comfort through hospice, why would they be a full code, right? And I believe that again, some of people's hesitance around do not resuscitate is because they don't understand what it means. And I think some people feel that it means do not treat. That's not what it means. What do not resuscitate means is if your heart stopped, that they would not do cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So, and I think it's important that people understand, uh, particularly when people have an advanced illness, of what are, what, is, what are the ramifications of doing cardiopulmonary resuscitation when people are frail and fragile and have uh, an extended illness? And, and what is the, the success rate? What are the benefits, burdens to that? So people need to have these things explained really well to them so that they can make well-informed decisions. So as I mentioned, some of those benefits, you got that team approach, right? And the experts in end-of-life care those pain and other symptoms. And, and I'll tell you, we focus so much on pain, but there's other symptoms too, right? Whether that be shortness of breath or anxiety or um, uh, vomiting, nausea, vomiting, other symptoms like that that can be extremely overwhelming to people. Uh, it's hard to do a lot of work around, um, you know, the emotional and spiritual issues that, that people can have if they're writhing in pain or they're having uncontrollable nausea or vomiting or, or a shortness of breath, that sort of thing. So it's important that we're, we manage those things well so that people have the, the comfort and freedom to do those other things that they would like to do. Uh, they have that 24-hour access to the hospice team. There's the medication and equipment needs, as I mentioned, um, that are covered, and that bereavement support. You know, bereavement support, you know, so one of the Medicare conditions of participation is that you provide bereavement care for, for the people, like I said, that are left behind, who have lost that person. Now, basically what it does is, you know, I will, I ask people, what is a normal grief period? Well, there's no such thing. You know, I mean, everybody's, you know, just as the, the dying uh, journey is unique, so is a grief period for people. So, or grief uh, experience. Everybody's journey is different in their grief process as well. So what, what basically the, the regulation is, is that you provide bereavement support for at least 13 months after a person's death. Uh, to those left. And then, so the reason for that is it gets you through the, the holidays and the, the anniversary date for that person. Now, the way it works, though, is that certainly people can get, uh, you know, they, it's not like at the 13 months people say, no, you can't get any more support. Some people will need support long after that, and others not not even up to that. I'll have people that even after a couple of months, they'll say, I, I feel well supported, I'm good, and other people that, you know, they're even going into the end of that second year or whatever, they're saying, I, I still need support. There's no right or wrong. Everybody's unique in that way. There's different levels of hospice, so I just want to bring these up for you. I'm going to explain these four levels. A lot of times people aren't even aware that there are levels of hospice care. 97% of all people are actually on the routine level of hospice, and what that does is that actually provides all those the care and the services I've talked with up till this point. So most people are on this. They're getting the team visits wherever they call home, uh, equipment, medication needs, all of those things. Um, so that's the routine level of hospice. Where can you get routine level? Anywhere that person calls home. Then there's that general inpatient level. That's This is as highly skilled. This is a small percentage of people that go on this. This is for people that are having complicated pain or symptom issues. So where can people receive the general inpatient level? At a licensed inpatient 
hospice facility. Like I said, we have two, the Kaplan Family Hospice House and the Care Dimensions Hospice House. The one is in Danvers and the other one's on the Lincoln Waltham line in Massachusetts. So so there's the, you can in a licensed inpatient facility. Um, so that's where you can receive that. You can also receive this general inpatient level of care in a skilled nursing facility if the facility has a, a general inpatient contract with the hospice. Um, you can also have that in a hospital. If the hospital has a general inpatient contract with that hospice, you can actually have that general inpatient level of care. Once a person is out of that acute crisis, if their pain and symptoms get, this is complicated pain or symptom issues. Once those are well managed, then the person will revert back to that routine level of hospice care. Respite is another level of care. This is for people that they're at home. And and the you know maybe that they the person wants to die at home or and the family wants to have them there but maybe the family is exhausted and they just need a small break or maybe the family even needs to go out of town for a couple of days. The respite benefit is it's you have you're on the hospice service and you can actually access this respite con, uh, benefit. You can go into a licensed inpatient facility or you can go into a skilled nursing facility where the hospice has a respite contract and you can stay for five days and it's covered at 100%. It's really a nice benefit to people. And then the person can go back to where they call home. Uh, continuous care, is it's, a, it's kind of like that general inpatient level only in the home. Uh, with the continuous care, a very small portion of people actually access this level of care. Uh, and the reason for that is that this generally is for people that are in the last 72 hours of life that have complicated pain and symptom issues uh, that need to be aggressively managed. 51% um, of the care has got to require a skilled nursing need for this. Uh, the other uh, amount can actually be done, the 49% could be from a, a uh, an aid or such. But And you can have from eight hours up to 24 hours of care. Now, why oftentimes people don't tap into this is if people are in this type of a crisis, um, oftentimes they, the, the families feel like it's better for them to have this managed in a more structured setting, like a licensed inpatient hospice facility uh, or somewhere like that. So that's why that can be, uh, it's, there's not a lot of people that actually use that, that particular level. So those are the different levels of hospice care. I talked to you about bereavement. Uh, and certainly with the bereavement support, uh, it, there's, there's that you know, support groups and workshops, individual counseling that can be available. Um, we actually have what's the, the, the only freestanding Center for Grief and Healing in the state. It's called the Bertillon Center for Grief and Healing. And basically, um, this is not just for people who are on hospice. We actually provide support to community as well. So if somebody had a loss and they needed to go to a support group, uh, they would be able to do that even if they did not use the utilize the hospice services and those those uh, support groups are all at no cost so this is a wonderful resource for people um, I just want to say about support groups too important that support groups there's so many different specific kinds it's important that they are specific you can't have everybody go into one support group if you have the loss of a child versus the loss uh, of uh, an old a parent, it, there, there's really distinctions in terms of those kinds of losses. So it's important to get into uh, more specific groups with the type of loss the person has had to help them to provide that kind of support. Some of these barriers that gets in the way, certainly it's uh, people's, um, you know, th th there's always something more to try. Even when medical intervention is futile, sometimes people persist around this. And, and that uh, can really affect somebody's quality of life. So understanding of that, um, sometimes there's not a lot of training for people around end-of-life issues. And they certainly don't understand hospice and palliative care. And certainly we are uh, a death denying society, particularly in this culture. So it's important that we have these conversations so that people don't feel so isolated in this process. So, you know, I, it, it's hard when you see late referrals come in because certainly, um, you know, pain and other symptoms aren't managed well if, when that happens, when people come on really late. Uh, and, and, you know, this is a time that you can address so many things for people, whether it be um, physical, spiritual, emotional. So the more time that they have on service, you're able to get into those things more. And when you do have people coming in and they're on 
service for hours or days. It really is more like crisis, inter uh, crisis management, crisis intervention. So always helpful when people can come on sooner. Um, and like I said, I hear so many times when people wish they had come on sooner. So that was, you know, I'm, I'm giving you a lot of information on hospice. Let me talk about palliative care. So I just talked about hospice being a benefit that you're signing on to, that generally a person is considered terminal in nature, um, generally seen that they it wouldn't be, that wouldn't be surprised if the person didn't live beyond that six month period of time. Um, but generally, like I said, you know, with palliative care, for us in our organization, uh, there are many palliative care programs out there. We have one that is uh, very, it's a palliative care program, I, and you're not signing on to a benefit with this. Pa you can be seen by palliative, uh, you don't have to be terminal in nature, but palliative is for people who have a serious illness or an advanced illness. Um, you know, it, it provides a lot of support certainly, uh, in terms of helping uh, with early identification around uh, looking at the disease process, uh, what, what, are the, uh, what are the treatment options, what are the benefits, what are the burdens, uh, and also what are the person's priorities and how to align the treatment approach to the person's priorities. So palliative care for us, it's a consultative service. Uh, that person can be seen once or they could be seen several times. You know, if I had a cardiac issue, I would see a cardiologist. If I was diagnosed with a life-limiting illness, I would probably call a, a palliative care specialist, even initially, and, and diseases unfold at different rates. Uh, so it, it's helpful to talk even to just, you know, part of what palliative care does is it helps with pain and symptom issues. That's part of it. But that's about 50% of what our palliative care specialists do. They see people around pain and other symptoms. And the other part is that they have these goals of care or advanced care planning conversations. These are important conversations that are important as important as any other type of procedure. And not all physicians are well-versed in having these conversations. So with palliative care, like I said, people can be seen once, they can be seen several times. They can be pursuing curative treatments. You don't have to be terminal in nature, but they still, palliative care still addresses the spirit, mind, and body. Um, people can, like I said, they, they, you know, they don't have to, it's not a pain clinic. I always like to say that to people because sometimes people say, well, geez, you know, I have had this backache for 20 years. You know, can I, can I come have palliative care seen? It's not a pain clinic. That's not what it's about. Um, but again, it's for people, a consult, consultative service for people that have more of a, a progressive or, or a serious illness in those ways. So some of the other things, so pain and symptom management, they help around um, those diagnosis and prognosis discussion. Um, you know, just looking at possibilities, goals of care, um, and advanced care planning. They, they're just very skilled in these types of discussions. Uh, and even other care or treatment that's impacting quality of life. Some of those symptoms, I, you know, like I said, we always talk about pain, but there's other things that people experience too like shortness of breath, a delirium, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, even spiritual distress. Um, yeah, like I said, in my career, I've had many individuals that have had spiritual distress that they were in a great deal of suffering from. So, you know, it's, it's lo looking at, um, you know, it's it, the goal, checking, looking at what is the goal. And a goal can mean different things to different people. Um, you know, goals can certainly be to cure, but other goals are to relieve suffering or add to quality of life. Um, you know, maintaining function and helping people to stay in control. People like to be in control of their health care generally um, and get, certainly giving support to families. So I'm going to, I want to talk about, I want to look at these side by side for you. So let's look at palliative care and hospice care. So here are some of the similarities. Both serve, like for palliative care, which is a consultative service, and versus hospice, which is a benefit that you're signing on to. They both want to look at pain and symptom management. They both make sure that that is something that's addressed. Quality of life is essential in both regards. Education, both of these provide education to not just the, the individual and the family, but also to caregivers and the medical team as well. Spirit, mind, and body, they're addressing the whole person in all regards. And both of these, both the palliative care service and the hospice um, care, they can be provided in any setting that the person calls home. Now, let's look at some of the differences. As I mentioned, 
hospice care is is you're pursuing care and comfort generally uh it's in you you're generally not pursuing curative treatment um but with palliative care people can continue to pursue that curative treatment uh so it's not based palliative is not based on life expectancy where with hospice again generally it is felt that you wouldn't be surprised if the person had 6 months or less to live palliative is consultative in nature um, so it's not that benefit, like I said, that people sign on to like hospice. Palliative care is covered under Medicare Part B and private insurances, where hospice is covered under Medicare Part A and, 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 and private insurances and, and Medicaid. So there's, you can see there's a distinction in terms of coverage. If you go see your specialist or a doctor or any specialist, basically, and if you're covered under Medicare, they're billing Part B. So they're not billing Part A. So hospice is covered under A. Palliative is covered under Part B. Um, palliative in terms of clarifying goals of care. And hospice is around that interdisciplinary support. Now, with our palliative consultative service, though, if somebody, if the nurse practitioner or the physician went out or the nurse and they found with the person on palliative care that they needed to, um, if they had a spiritual or a psychosocial issue, they would send a social worker or a chaplain out, uh, but it's not dispensed in the same manner as you would be if you were on the hospice benefit, uh, but you can still access that type of support. Um, in terms of who can make a referral, uh, anybody. Anybody can make a referral to either palliative or to hospice, but you do need a doctor's order. Oftentimes we can get called and uh, people will say, you know, I, I want to look into palliative care. Or I want to even see about eligibility around hospice. And we can even pursue and call the physician for that person and, and see about obtaining the order. So anybody can make that referral. Now, I also just wanted to go back for a second and just talk about, uh, and then I'm going to stop so I can open it up for questions here. I just want to go back for a minute. Um, just this coverage in terms of Part A and Part B, um, it matters because let's say, I want to show you why this can this can be in fact. So if somebody is in a skilled nursing facility and they're covered under their skilled benefit, um, that's Medicare Part A. So a person can't be in a facility under their Part A, even though that's, again, it's time limited that they're on that, but they can't be covered under their skilled benefit in a facility and receive hospice care because they're both Part A. So they would basically either have to waiver that or they would have to wait until they're, they've done their skilled benefit and then when they come off of that there, then hospice can get involved. Now, maybe they're on their skilled benefit and they're having pain and other symptoms, which is a concern, and we could have them see, they can stay on their skilled benefit and we could have palliative care go in and they can help. Palliative care can see a person um, and, and they can just follow them for palliative, and then they might not ever go on to hospice. Or sometimes palliative is looked at as a bridge program. It's not always, but it can be a bridge to hospice. Uh, so that, that's another useful tool. I had mentioned the visiting nurse association. Sometimes people will be followed for a short time under visiting nurse, but they like to get hospice involved too. You can't have the VNA and the hospice in at the same time because they're both under part Medicare Part A. Um, so, but people can be still covered under the Visiting Nurse Association um, even for a short time, and they could be followed by palliative because that's Part B. So sometimes, and we, we do a lot of work with, with um, VNAs, uh, Visiting Nurse Associations, in terms of a bridge program there as well. So I am going to stop now, and I, I want to be able to open this up. I'm sure that people have questions about it. I'm giving a lot of information in a short period of time. Yes, we do have a, uh, a few questions that we'll, I hope we'll have time for all of them. Uh, first question I'd like to pose from a participant is, does uh, the individual or family decide to participate in hospice, or is it suggested by the doctor? What, what a great, great question. So I want to answer that in a couple of different ways. So, um, so basically, um, you, you can't always wait and, and um, because it, the doctor won't always bring it up. Sometimes, again, that's not on their radar. 
uh, even though a person can be at a point where they are hospice eligible, that it might not be something that the physician bring up. Sometimes it is brought up by, um, you know, it could be any healthcare worker, it could be a nurse, a social worker, or whoever. But again, you, it's, you don't always have to wait for a healthcare professional or certainly the physician to bring it up. I have had many situations where um, the patient or the family did. Now, certainly um, in terms of that too, I just wanted to answer that in a different way too. Sometimes, you know, you might have a family um, who wants, the, wants hospice involved, but they don't want their loved one to know about it. Well, that gets tricky because, again, if a person has capacity, the individual or the, pa the identified patient has, has capacity and they are able to make their own decisions, we can't not tell the person where we're from. Uh, so if a person does not have capacity and their, their loved one is actually serving in, in the um, role as their healthcare agent, then they can, again, we don't have to say who that is because they're not able to make that decision. But again, so people, but a person can absolutely make that decision and, and call. You won't be, you won't go on to hospice unless you're meeting criteria. Uh, but like I said, you do need to have a doctor's order, but you don't always, don't always wait for the physician to bring it up because we assume when it's time they will, it doesn't always work that way. It's not always on their radar. So we have to be our own best advocate. And what's important is that people learn and understand a lot about these things so that they can actually bring it up to their provider. Um, there, there are some healthcare professionals that don't have a really good understanding of this. And uh, we actually do physician to physician education to try to help them to better understand this. Uh, so that they're not opposed to this. Because like I said, this is a, a benefit that people are entitled to uh, and that should be able to access uh, as they're appropriate and as when they're meeting criteria. I hope I answered that person's question. Angela, David, do you have another question? Hi. Oh, can you hear me, Mary? Uh, now I can. I had I couldn't hear you before, but go ahead. I can hear you now. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so the next question was: As a scleroderma patient, I have a huge team of doctors. To what extent do pal palliative care providers work with my team of doctors? Yeah, they work well with other physicians. So there would be a lot of communication going on between all of them. So one, having palliative care involved does not take the place of the team that you already have in place. To me, they're, they're actually an added support and uh, they uh, and another, I, I feel like what we have to do when we, ha when we have a serious illness, one of the first things I always say is that we need to build our team. We, people um, have to have their team of support and, and the, that medical team and our team in other areas too, right? And part of that is so you're going to have your team of physicians. None of them come out of play. Uh, this is an add-on in this, this level of expertise in here that's a complement to what you're already getting. And there's communication. Uh, palliative care would make recommendations and your primary team uh, they don't have to even agree with that. They can say, no, I'm not in favor of that recommendation or this and that, and they, they would talk that out and they would communicate together. Uh, so there's really good communication that happens within that. Very good question. Thank you. That's a very thorough answer. Thanks so much. So the next question. Sure. Oh, yeah. The next question is my my physician's don't seem to be comfortable talking about hospice care. How can I get more information? Well, you know, and, and that's, that's what worries me sometimes is that, you know, for some reason or another, not all physicians are comfortable with having these discussions. And, uh, you know, this is, it's, and sometimes again, you know, it's, uh, they feel like, you know, they're like, the hospice care, like I said, it's not about giving up. It's not about all of those things. So 
I think it's important that people get educated in other ways. So there's different ways. Certainly, um, you know, depending on where you're located, uh, there's there's National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, NHPCO, it's called, National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. You can go on their website because, again, I want to make sure, I know that there are people from all over on this, so I want to make sure that people have access to a more general. Certainly, again, in the state of Massachusetts, um, I, I welcome people to get a hold of us anytime. You can call our organization, uh, Care Dimensions, and you can ask for, for information, and we, can, we certainly send out informational packets all the time to people. Um, but in terms of, you know, knowing, like, within that State, uh, NHPCO will give general information about hospice, excellent website, and also tell you about what, what, what hospices are available in that area and, and palliative care. So that would be a good resource to tap into. And, you know, I think it's important that we, we talk openly with our doctors, right? As of January 1st, 2016, um, there was, they actually passed a law that said that um, people can actually make an appointment with their physician and they can actually have these advanced care planning or goals of care conversations and they can actually bill for it. I was so happy when this came up because I always worry about this is that, that, that I don't want there to be an obstacle. We need to have these discussions with our healthcare providers. And if they're not willing to have these discussions, we need to discuss that you know, that, that you need to talk about this and you need to be able to, you know, to do that and, and, and you know, find out why this is an obstacle. Um, but so this is a good thing that this came through as of 2016, January 1st. So what that does is, you know, I think there were time constraints. There was certainly reimbursement issues around that for physicians in terms of having these conversations. But now that's solved. But I also think that there's another component to this is making sure that, um, that, that again, the physician needs to have a skill set around having these types of difficult conversations. And not, our, not everybody is comfortable with that. And that's why I think it's so helpful, um, you know, in, to have palliative care involved in that regard, to have these open discussions. Uh, and I think people want to talk about this generally, uh, but they don't always feel uh, comfortable or maybe feel like they can approach their provider in that way. So that's a certain, you know, so you can do that in a lot of other ways, get information, but make sure you get it from reputable sources. So like I said, the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, very reputable source, NHPCO. Thank you. That was, that was wonderful. And I know that's a wonderful resource, the NHPCO. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the next question, they, uh, a few patients were actually hoping that you could expand a little more on what goes into a doctor's order uh, slash a referral for hospice. Yeah, so in terms of that, so what what happens is like I said, with an order, it's just a written order giving permission for us to actually go out and to provide an assessment to see uh, if somebody is, uh, it's giving permission in a way. That's what an order does, right? It's, it's giving that permission for us to go out and to, to, to have that, um, that consultation with the individual. So what they would do is uh, they would come out. And, and so once with the doctor's order, that authorizes us to go and have contact with that person. And the person's agreeable to this, of course. Uh, we would never go see somebody, even based on a doctor's order, if the person wasn't receptive to our coming out. Uh, so then what would happen is that one of our nurses, or, or again, with it, depending on which group, we have uh, a nurse uh, that, that are uh, that do um, admission nurses from hospice, or we have, like I said, it would be a, a nurse or a nurse practitioner or even possibly a physician coming out for palliative care that would be um, doing a full assessment. And, and I'll tell you, it's a, it's a very thorough assessment where they're asked, getting information about, um, you know, your health issues and, and your history and, and all of that. They, they really do a very detailed assessment. So if this isn't a five-minute thing when they come out, this is something that uh, they work very thoroughly with and, and really getting an idea of what's important to you, which, which is really a part that I just value so very much. It's so important that we understand that about the person and, and what their priorities are and, and what their understanding of the disease is and all of those things. So 
um, they would come out and they would do that assessment and then again make recommendations. So if that person, if that referral was for hospice, they came out, did that assessment, they would see and, and uh, ascertain whether the person is actually hospice eligible. For palliative care, the person would come in and they would do that assessment and then they would make a determination of if there any recommendations that they would have and discuss those recommendations with you uh, and if you wanted family there. Uh, and then they would actually have contact with your primary care provider or your, the, any of the physicians that were involved around what those recommendations are. And then uh, the, your primary care would actually, either, if there were suggestions around uh, anything, whether it was medication or this or that, they would, they would actually um, certainly be able to agree to that or not. So that's really how that all works. So like I said, it's, it's a very thorough process. And like I said, it's not a, a quick five-minute thing. This is something that they really take time with you, which is very nice. Uh, Mary, I'm going to consolidate a couple of questions together. So this is a question that could probably be a, its own presentation, but I want to get it in in the interest of, of time. Uh, many people living with scleroderma have limitations that may include being on oxygen, on a feeding tube, um, other things that are uh, uniquely um, related to having scleroderma, do hospice and palliative care um, providers, do they work well with these limitations? And related, um, how would they know about um, the intricacies of scleroderma? Oh, very good question. You know, we work with a variety of, uh, of individuals who have very, that, that is, you know, one of the things that um, hospice or palliative care does not do is we don't cookie cut or approach it. You can't do that because every individual is different. So, we, you know, we, we work with a variety of people with a variety of illnesses, and it's important, too, that, you know, they, they, um, they know a lot about different diseases, but they also will get a lot of information about particular situations too, to be well informed about um, disease process and all. And and as we know, you can have many people with a similar illness, but it can have a different presentation. So, like I said, there's never this cookie cutter approach. It's very individualized. So all of the work that they do with you is is pertaining to you and, and creating that plan of care around you as an individual and as a family. So that's, that's how that would work. So they would find that information out uh, if, they, if they didn't have information and they, they needed more information, uh, that's what they would do. And, and certainly, again, understanding how have you been impacted by this disease uh, so that they can have a clear understanding of that. They work really well within that, and, and they would tell you if there were any um, obstacles or, or things that would, um, you know, be, that, that would get in the way for some reason, they would notify you of that. that um, but, but a lot of times, again, we're, we're working with people with a variety. Like I said, it's not just about cancer. We have a variety of people from all different types of, uh, that have different types of illnesses that we're working with, and we're really understanding uh, the unique needs of individuals within that, that diagnosis and, and how that uh, is playing out for that individual. Thank you. Sure. Um, so we're getting pretty close to the top of the hour, but I'd like to sneak one last question in, if that's okay. Of course. Um, yeah. So the, the, the last question um, is, how involved will I be in the decisions regarding my care if I qualify for hospice? And then the individual goes on to explain that as their health um, declines and they lose their ability to, um, you know, really communicate effectively, um, what happens from that point? Um, excellent question. You are very involved. This, you know, this the care surrounds you. You're 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 really. Uh, you, you know, I, I always say the individual and, 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 you know, the family as that person wants involved, uh, you know, really they're driving the bus. I, it's really important. This isn't about, we don't come in and just take over uh, and tell you what you're going to do. This is around, it's very person centered. 
uh, very individual centered in terms of what your wishes are. That's what I love about process or palliative care is that there's really a lot of, of that goes into understanding the individual and what their idea, what their their priorities are, and how to align that treatment approach to their priorities. So very much they're involved. So it's very important to be able to ascertain from that individual what their wishes are. This is and talk about a you know you had mentioned a, a topic for for a, that's a whole other program. It's making wishes known. This is really important in terms of advanced directives, advanced, you know, in that way, um, because when you're not able to to make your own decisions or to voice your own concerns, um, certainly I, people need to be in charge and, and, and in control of their health care for whatever time they have left. What we need to do is have advanced directives in place so that when we are no longer able, if we lack capacity and we're not able to make those decisions for ourselves, that we have appointed somebody to be our voice. I always say an advanced directive is not putting somebody in place to make our healthcare decisions for us. We should be choosing that person ahead of time of who is going to not make decisions on our behalf, but who's going to be our voice when we're not able to do that for ourselves. I'm going to tell you that's a whole other hour presentation in terms of talking about advanced directives and planning ahead in that way. So I really encourage people, everybody should be doing this. 18 and over, we should all have advanced advanced directives in place, healthcare proxies, even um, you know, written out in terms of guiding our wishes, having these discussions. Not every there's only 25 to 30 percent of the population that has these in place. That that is difficult. So and and then add on to it. If people have a serious illness or a life limiting illness, it even ups the ante even more. Here we are in a pandemic, right? And and this I have actually seen people are in a panic in a way too because for people certainly everybody's worried about health right now. People that are in high risk situations are even more concerned, and now people are wanting to talk more about what their wishes are. So I think it is very, very important. So what the, the we certainly do is talk with that person, get you have them involved to whatever degree they can in terms of making their own decisions. And when they are not able to do that, if they do lack capacity, then, it, you know, and it's not just lacking, uh, it, like if they have issues that are interfering with their being able to communicate verbally, we'll look at other ways of communicating with them too in terms of making sure wishes are still followed. But if people lack capacity, then we look to who is it that they have appointed as their agent so that make sure that, again, that person, and it's so important that we pick our healthcare agent wisely so that, again, that we, we make sure that they're being our voice to follow through on what our wishes are. And again, the big part of that is they can't, that in order to do that, pick the person wisely, but have a discussion about what those things are. If a person does not feel like they're capable of honoring your wishes and following through with that, that's not the person you want as your healthcare agent, your healthcare proxy, right? So that, like I said, I'd love to go into a whole other hour program with you at some point on talking about the importance of health that of advanced directives and all of that. Well, that's very powerful. And, and, and I agree. I think that's a, a topic that we definitely need to cover. And with that, Mary, do you have any, as we wrap up, do you have any parting comments for, for everyone gathered here today? Yeah, I just want to thank you again uh, for inviting me to, to be a part of this with you. Uh, and I hope that you got a lot out of this. I know this was a lot of information, uh, but it's important information. And I hope when you leave here today that there's less confusion, that I have cleared up some of these myths and misconceptions around hospice and palliative care, and that people really know that this is something that is, it's a wonderful thing that people are entitled to, that is a support that can add to that that, like I told you, your team uh, in terms of helping people to live fully for whatever time they have left. Thank you so much, Mary. And in closing, I'd like to thank I'd like to thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us today. And I'd also like to thank our attendees that logged in or dialed in today. And a special thanks to our Diamond National sponsors, Actilian Pharmaceuticals US and Bowringer Ingelheim and our corporate sponsor, Corbis Pharmaceuticals. 
As a reminder, we will be hosting these virtual university webinars weekly. Next Wednesday, October 7th, we will be joined by Dr. Leslie Ann Sakaku, who will be talking to us on learning to love our friend, the gut. Um, please stay connected with us through our website, scleroderma.org, and social media outlets to stay informed on our virtual university patient education fall series and all of our great chapter virtual events happening now across the country. Thank you very much, and this will conclude today's webinar.